Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Tamara Cohn from Sky News and a very warm welcome to this year's George Bradshaw Address. It's wonderful to see you all here uh, for what I know is a key event in the industry and political calendars. And as you can see, if you've been with us before, it's slightly different this year. We are pioneering an election special featuring the Rail Minister Hugh Merriman and the man who wants his job, the Shadow Rail Minister uh, Stephen Morgan. Now, as someone who works in news, I know that rail too often only hits the headlines when we've got delays, strikes or fare increases. But actually, in the past year, I've noticed that rail has often been top of the news bulletins for other reasons. And I think that's because it's clear we're at a crossroads in terms of whether the railways will recover from the pandemic, how they'll be paid for, what our national level of ambition should be in terms of investing in new ones, with, of course, some high-profile projects cancelled, but others given the green light. And all of this has major implications for what we as taxpayers care deeply about, which is how we live and work and, of course, grow the economy. So tonight, I look forward to extracting a bit more detail uh, from these two political figures about what their plans are. We know they're both committed to reforming the railways, the government set out its framework just today, but hasn't yet brought forward the legislation. Labour tells us about public ownership, but we haven't yet seen the scope of it. So I know you'll have lots of questions, and I have a few as well. Now, as a political journalist, I've actually interviewed various politicians while on trains. I think my record is a single day in which I took five separate train journeys with Jeremy Corbyn during the 2017 election. But I'm very happy to be with you here tonight on steady ground to ask these politicians how they're going to be running our railways for passengers and businesses now and into the future. But before I do that, I'm going to introduce you to a man who has plenty of ideas about how that should happen, and that is Andy Bagnall from our host's Rail Partners. So please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome on behalf of Rail Partners and its members to the 2024 George Bradshaw Address. It's really great to see so many of you here in person uh, and also so many people watching this event online. Now, after the Secretary of State gave the George Bradshaw Address last year, I was a bit worried how we were going to put on an equally big draw. But with our two keynote speakers uh, this evening and in a general election almost certainly later this year, I hope you'll agree uh, we've done it. I'm really pleased to welcome Hugh and uh, Stephen. Thank you both for joining us and for embracing this election special format. As Britain heads to the polls in the next 12 months, I suspect that for the majority of voters, rail policy will not be a top order issue compared to the NHS or the economy. But while the railway might not matter for the election, this election really matters for the railway. Whoever forms the next government will find rail reform sitting in their intray, uh, and the choices they make will shape the railway for generations to come. This is an industry that's up for change, crying out for it even. Um, but to change for the better, we have to correctly diagnose the causes of the pretty significant challenges we're facing in order to then prescribe the right solutions. We have a system that was struggling even before the pandemic. Uh, accountabilities had become blurred between government, operators and network rail. Incentives had become misaligned. Franchising had essentially run its course. This was then compounded by the coronavirus lockdowns, upending the industry's finances, and revenue has still not recovered to this day. Perhaps, though, a less visible impact of the pandemic is that the government put in place emergency structures, which, while they were absolutely right for the crisis, they largely remain in place four years on and are now hindering growth and recovery. While the badges on the trains remain the same, under the surface, passenger operators are now effectively already in the public sector and subject to a level of micromanagement by government not seen even under British Rail. And that's, of course, before I mention the longest period of industrial action in the industry's history, partly driven by that financial challenge. This impacted not only passengers, but also the network rail disputes last year severely undermined freight operators' ability to deliver for their customers against fierce competition from road haulage. 
If we carry on like this, despite the evidence, more published just yesterday, showing that demand will grow if we make the right reforms, we will put a generation of people off travelling by rail, risking a permanently smaller railway. We have to avoid that outcome. Now, it would be wrong for me uh, in this introduction not to address the elephants in the room. There's one standing behind each of you, uh, Stephen and Hugh. Hugh, I'm, I'm going to start with yours, although actually I do first want to publicly acknowledge um, your personal advocacy for the industry uh, through what's been a really challenging time. We are grateful for that. However, uh, the government correctly identified the need for root and branch reform of the railway five years and four transport secretaries ago. Keith Williams' plan for rail, which had broad support, uh, was published nearly three years ago. And one year ago, the transport secretary stood where I stand now and promised new impetus for delivery. Now, while the draft bill published earlier today is a useful step forward and will kick off an important process of debate, without the actual legislation to create Great British Railways, the central tenets of the plan for rail are ultimately still in the sidings. So I hope that what we're here tonight is a commitment to hit the ground running if the government is re-elected and deliver against the plan for rail in the very first session of the next parliament. Stephen, I don't think your elephant will come as a surprise. It's a big one. Uh, while we agree with almost all of the outcomes that the Labour Party wants to achieve for the railway, we don't agree that a public monopoly is the best way to fix the industry. To distill all of the challenges we face down to a single issue of contract ownership is to misread uh, the causes of the railway's problems. In fact, I would go so far to say that government over-involvement, which we see on the railway at present, is undoubtedly one of the major contributing factors to poor outcomes and a stunted recovery. What matters is what works. And we would encourage you, if Labour is elected, to follow the evidence of our own experience here in Britain, but also the increasing evidence in Europe where EU countries are seeking to emulate many of the customer benefits delivered by competition over the last two decades here at home. At the least, I hope you'll invite the private sector to formally make its case before making final decisions. And on that point, Rail Partners set out our own five-point plan to create a thriving railway in our manifesto for rail published last week, and there are copies on your seats. Uh, we believe it's possible to get the best of both worlds to deliver for passengers and freight customers. A new public body to oversee the railway so customers know who's in charge, <clears throat> but harnessing the innovation and investment of private sector operators uh, to attract customers, grow revenue to balance the books, and free up taxpayers' money for other national priorities. We also need a stable environment for freight operators, to enable them to grow and help decarbonise supply chains. So, what I hope we're going to hear from both Hugh and Stephen is a clear vision for the future based on sound analysis. The railway is an essential enabler for the country's wider economic growth, for our ambitions to reach net zero, for inward investment into the regions. But it won't deliver on this potential if the next few years bring either further delay or unnecessary upheaval. Whoever wins the next election needs to follow the evidence and get on with reform. So I hope you'll enjoy the evening. I'm now going to hand back to Tamara to introduce the first of our two speakers. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Andy. Yes, the first speaker is going to be Hugh Merriman, who's going to talk to us for 10 minutes about the government's vision for rail. Now, Hugh has been an MP in East Sussex since 2015 and in the rail job, I think about a year and a half, but you're an old hand at this. You've been on the Transport Select Committee for seven years, sometimes criticising government policy and now seeing it from the other side. Um, Hugh spent his summer holidays on a five-week railway tour of England and Wales, such as his commitment to trains, and tonight he's going to tell us a bit more about what the government's planning. Thanks, Tamara. <coughs> Well, thank you very much indeed to you, Tamara, to Andy, to Rail Partners, and also to everybody here who's in the audience and everyone that you represent. Thank you for what you do to make the railways special. It's been a tough year as we build back from COVID and one of the toughest years on record for our railway for severe weather events. So what I want to do is to set out the government's vision for the railway, and I want to focus on the three aspects. Firstly, how we've grown our railway since privatisation. How, secondly, we have supported our railway during COVID. And thirdly, how we can use these twin pillars 
to further reform and renew our railway. So let's start with growth through the privatisation years. We start here because as we look to grow the railway, now more than ever, I believe we need to look to the model which doubled passenger numbers in just 20 years. And we weren't just good at attracting more passengers. Some statistics from 2013, which are food for thought. The UK was judged the most improved railway in Europe. The UK came second for Europe's most satisfied rail customers, topping Europe's seven major railways. And thirdly, the UK had the safest railway in Europe. And I thank the European Commission for those statistics. With this growth, the UK was able to make the largest financial investment in the railway, well over £100 billion since 2010. And with that investment, we have electrified over 1,200 miles of track since 2010. 75% of all passenger journeys are now undertaken on electrified lines. And that compares to the 63 miles of electrified line under the last Labour government between 1997 and 2010. In March 2016, our fleet size was just under 13,000 carriages. By the time COVID hit, it had risen to just under 16,000 carriages. I remember that we were the party that inherited and scrapped Pacer trains. More than 8,000 new train carriages have entered into service since 2010, with the average age of our fleet falling to less than 17 years. Second, let's talk about support through the pandemic. All of this growth that I've just described had meant that we were not just reinvesting in the railways, the private sector operators were delivering a financial return to the UK taxpayer. Then, as you know, COVID hit. But like you, we stood by the railway and ensured it continued to deliver for this country. Since the pandemic, we have supported rail services to the tune of 42 billion pounds. That's 1,500 pounds from every household in the UK. We did so and we continue to do so because we believe in rail, not only as the green way to travel, but as the catalyst for economic growth and regeneration. With these huge subsidies, it would have been easy to focus on keeping the railway we have, rather than build the railway for future generations. But we were doing both, and we are doing both. A real terms increase in our five-year renewal period programme at over £44 billion, as well as building new railways. We've now had a couple of years since lockdown was lifted, so it's fair to make an assessment of where passenger numbers and revenue are settling. The positive is that passengers are returning, with leisure travel, in fact, above pre-pandemic levels. But the change in working patterns, with many people now working from home a couple of days a week, means revenue is down by about 20%. And there's a fair few ways of dealing with this gap. We could reduce costs through reducing services, but none of us want that. We could ask the taxpayer to continue to plug the gap. But that isn't fair on taxpayers, many of whom don't regularly use the railways. Or we could reform the industry, embrace new technology and ways of working to reduce costs, improve performance and grow passenger revenue. The government is clear, it's the latter option that we are focused on. So thirdly, our vision to reform and renew our railways. But let's just take a moment first of all to reflect on a few projects we have delivered together over the last 14 years, in addition to the growth of passenger numbers I've just described. The completion of King's Cross Station and the creation of one of the greatest knowledge clusters anywhere in the world. The completion of Crossrail, bringing an extra one and a half million people to within 45 minutes of central London. Completion of sections of electrification for the Midland Main Line. Upgrade of East Anglia Main Line for new trains. Completion of the Thameslink upgrade, allowing 20 trains per hour to run. The £1 billion overhaul of London Bridge Station. The completion of electrification of Great Western Main Line and returning passenger services from Exeter to Oakhampton, and looking after the most vulnerable by opening our 240th step-free station and making accessibility improvements to 1,500 other stations. And what are the current and future plans? So the Rail Partners Manifesto, which I have here, and I'm sure you're reading it right now, published ahead of this event, provides a useful set of priorities for delivering improvements. I'll use each heading to describe what we are doing and our vision for the future. So heading number one, focus the railway on the customer. We've just reintroduced revenue incentives to existing contracts, because this aim from rail partners is to balance the books. We will set new passenger service contracts for tender in an open market, bringing private sector incentives of risk and reward to grow our railways once again. 
Your second ask is overhaul fares to offer customers the best value for their journey. We've introduced flexi season tickets. Almost a million have been sold. We're testing new pricing initiatives from the extension of single leg pricing uh, and the launch of a demand-based pricing trial on LNER. We've announced an extension of pay-as-you-go to 52 more stations in the southeast, rolled out this spring, bringing the total to 400 stations, as well as pay-as-you-go plans for 75 stations in the West Midlands and 16 in Greater Manchester. We've completed the rollout of barcoded e-tickets across the entire network and are now supporting operators to roll out digital season tickets. And we will invest in more pay-as-you-go technology to continue fare simplification. Your third ask, Andy, is to create a new public body to oversee the railways. Well, today, as you've mentioned, we have published the draft rail reform bill. Parliamentary scrutiny of this legislation was included in the King's speech and will be led by my old colleagues on the Transport Select Committee. Sorry, I should say former colleagues with Ian being in the audience, uh, whom I had my first session with officials this afternoon to kickstart the scrutiny process. And we've announced Derby as the headquarters for GBR. Your fourth ask, let operators compete to connect communities. Open access goes from strength to strength with our support. Lumo grew 16% year on year. Hull trains up 34%. Both generate demand above pre-COVID levels and have got plans to increase services. It's great to see more applications coming forward for routes across the country. And this innovation would be snuffed out under Labour. We will speed up the open access application process and we will attract more applicants by returning unused slots for new bidders. And your fifth ask, prioritise getting freight off roads and onto rail. We've set the rail freight growth target of 75% by 2050. We aim to give more access to freight to deliver to that number. I'm seeking the support of port operators to incentivise rail freight over road freight, replicating the Port of Southampton's excellent scheme. And we've deliberately selected new enhancements, such as those in Oxford, Liverpool to Hull, Ely and Hawley, so they create new paths for freight. Workforce reform, of course, is not in your manifesto, but it's important. People are at the heart of the railway, and I want to see good, rewarding careers for those in rail. But that does mean reform, like the New Deal network rail struck, which will allow greater use of technology, making rail more efficient and reliable, while safer and more rewarding uh, work will be in place. So bringing our vision to reality, this is what we are building right now. 140 miles of HS2 from London to West Midlands with the Euston Quarter to rival King's Cross. The Trans-Pennine route upgrade, electrifying the line from Manchester to Leeds, speeding up journey times for passengers uh, and freight. Uh, we are looking to expand Northern Powerhouse Rail by bringing in electrified lines from Hull, Sheffield and Bradford. We are investing three and a half billion pounds to, to improve the East Coast Main Line. We will complete the Midlands Main Line electrification project. We are restoring more beaching lines this includes the Northumberland line, which will be open this year. We're delivering the new Oxford to Railway, uh, phase one of which will be open next year. We are working on a new station for Bradford, which will kickstart a transformative city regeneration project. And we have a new freight connection to bring more freight trains out of Felixstowe. We have over 100 more step-free stations, either in construction or committed. And we're devolving a further £12 billion, which can be spent by mayors or local transport authorities across the north and the East Midlands. So, I conclude by offering you a plan to harness the best of the private and public sector to build modern railways which will be run by a private sector with a proven track record of growing passenger numbers and freight. We will put decision making in the hands of Great British Rail to integrate track and train. We will not build an unaffordable state bureaucracy run for the benefit of vested interests and trade unions. I look forward to Stephen setting out his vision for rail. Thank you. Hugh, thanks very much for that. Wanted to pick up on your point about rail reform because it was promised in the election manifesto 2019. It was three years ago that Grant Shapps unveiled his plan for Great British Railways saying it was an urgent priority that we get fundamental reform. Now, we know he's been pretty busy since then. He's been Home Secretary, Business Secretary, Energy Secretary, and now Defence Secretary. But Great British Railways has not made such runaway progress. Why is that? 
Well, so firstly, Great British Railways, in the form of the transition team, has been doing the reform parts that I actually discussed about the simplification of tickets, uh, the, the station study that's just been done for all 2,500 of our stations. A whole plethora of reform plans have been put together by that transition team who were put in place ready because the bulk of this job is a change management job. It's the biggest change management job across Whitehall. The legislation is the part that allows it to happen. It's an enabler. But the legislation is relatively straightforward. 19 clauses, the key one, the one at the very beginning, being the transfer of powers to award contracts from the Secretary of State to uh, the integrated rail body, to GBR. Uh, and that's what we've published today. But what we've been getting on with is the change management aspect of it. And I've been lucky to work with the GBRTT team, my own department, and figures such as Andrew and Peter from Network Rail to actually bring that change along. And, and that will be the biggest part of the job, not the actual legislation. You say the legislation is relatively straightforward, and that's what all sides tell us. But we are not now going to complete all the stages before the general election, are we? It's, it's, there's not enough time. So we have a first session, as I mentioned, with, with Ian, who's there, and I'm grateful to him and the Transport Select Committee who have always taken interest in rail reform. They're the right cross-party place with the expertise uh, to be able to scrutinise it. So they, of course, will look to, to scrutinise. Ian very kindly set out uh, their ambition in terms of time to try and get us to the place of scrutiny uh, by summer. Uh, and all I would say is, if it's a relatively straightforward bill, um, then actually it should be in a positive place to be able to land whenever that time, time but comes. But it's going to be, it's not going to be this side of the election, even in the, in last year's King's speech, it was only a draft that was promised. You don't expect the legislation to give the powers to Great British Railways to be this side of the election. So I recognise it was published, uh, the, the King's speech was published where we would get the pre-legislative, sorry, say that again, pre-legislative scrutiny of this bill, which also I feel is absolutely right, because once we've got that pre-led scrutiny, that will demonstrate if it has the cross-party support, if it has the industry support, if there is a real embrace for reform. Uh, and all I'll say is that at, at the earliest attempt, I will actually seek to land that with legislation, because uh, reform was, at the, it was in our manifesto. Uh, reform is badly needed by the industry. And I, I was struck by the way that both Rail Partners and Network Rail came together about a year ago uh, with the entire sort of rail team, uh, the family, and said, if we can land this reform, then we will make the railways better. So my message to everyone in this room is that it might not deliver every single facet for what you want, but if we actually want reform, and we believe that if we don't have reform, the railway will be worse off, then land this bill uh, in but terms of its scrutiny, deliver, and I will then look to land it in terms of the actual legislation. It might not deliver any of those aspects if you don't get it done and another party ends up in government. If it's a straightforward piece of legislation, I know your boss, Mark Harper, said it was unlikely to happen before the election. You speak to the Prime Minister. Is he committed to rail reform? Is there a sense that other parts of government don't share your commitment to getting it done? No, there is that commitment. But I, again, I think it's very sensible, particularly with an industry that's been through so many challenges and, and, and will have its own views, to get that scrutiny, to allow the industry the, and all the rail organisations here to come before the Transport Select Committee, give the evidence, potentially actually appear, give views, then the Select Committee works out what its recommendations will be. And if the Select Committee decides that the bill as is, is that right balance and should go ahead, then of course I will actually look to that mandate to then try and get the earliest legislative slot. And um, if you don't get it done before the election, do you think it will be in the manifesto? Is the Prime Minister committed enough to it that it will be in the manifesto? Look, that's well above my pay grade <laughs> in terms of who writes manifestos. Uh, it's certainly not going to be me. But you know, of course, my passion is for rail reform. Um, and all I would say is, no matter, no matter who is in, in my post uh, after an election, I hope that they will deliver this rail reform because the industry is, is at one in wanting it. Integrating track and train, making those efficiencies, everyone working together uh, is the prize that everyone should be focused on. And quite frankly, whoever is sitting in this seat as rail minister, I very much hope will deliver that because my first priority is for the rail industry. Thanks, Hugh. Um, Stephen Morgan is the Labour MP for Portsmouth South and has been covering the rail brief for just six months. It's a quite a steep le learning curve. Uh, Labour is committed also to major rail reform, but to bringing railways back into public ownership as the contracts expire. So we'll like to hear more about those plans. Uh, Stephen, I'm told, does not drive and is a very regular rail user. At one point, um, commuting by train from Portsmouth to his job in Kensington. Uh, so that shows real commitment. Stephen, thank you. Thank you. 
Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Tamara, for that introduction, and to Andy and the entire team at Rail Partners for organising this evening. And thank you also, everyone here today, who have given me such a warm welcome since I became the Shadow Rail Minister just a few months ago. As I've said before, one of the great pleasures I've had since taking on this role has been getting to know people in this room and the wider rail sector in the past few months. And in that time, I've been so struck by the passion people in this sector have for their trade. The man I met working at Lit Church Lane in Derby, just as his father, grandfather and great-father, great-grandfather did before him. And by how incredibly dedicated, enthusiastic and ambitious all of you are for our industry. And I believe it's my party's job to match that ambition. Because Britain's railways are vital to our national success. They are key to growing our economy, helping us to meet our climate commitments, connecting us to friends and family, to seeing parts of our beautiful country we never otherwise would, to supporting people get to college, following their football team, and enabling people like me who don't have a car to do their job by visiting every part of the country. But it's increasingly clear we need a modern rail system for a modern Britain and that major reform is urgently needed. In the first five months of my role, I've already seen phase two of HS2 suddenly cancelled, plans for the so-called Network North picked apart as glaring errors and re-announcements were exposed. A screeching U-turn on the ticket office closure plans. Minimum service levels, which the government was warned would only worsen the state of industrial relations, were introduced, but as predicted, of no help to our railways. And repeated re-announcements of rail reforms. Over the five years after the government accepted reform was needed, this time from a transport secretary who has made clear he is not interested in doing a thing about the pressing problems our rail network before this general election. Despite that, they have said today that this government has made crystal clear over the past decade that rail reform is simply not a priority for them. And I'm here to tell you today that it will be a priority for Labour. It is abundantly clear to anyone watching that our railways are in a state of paralysis and in need of urgent, fundamental reform. But instead, they're subject to constant tinkering and meddling and interference by ministers and from Whitehall, leading to confusion, delays, U-turns, and ultimate failure to deliver for passengers. Nowhere has this failure been more evident than with the shambles this government has made of HS2. A decision which means that this government's flagship levelling up project reaches neither central London nor the north of England, which ensures that a staggering £67 billion high-speed train now hits the slow coach lane the second it enters the north, and according to the chair of HS2, means fewer seats and longer journeys on an already strained trans transport bottleneck. Now, this level of chaos and incompetence has been deeply damaging to our railway industry and to investor confidence in the UK. So now is the time to be asking, how have we ended up here? Why is it that so many are now concluding that Britain, the country which built the railways, can no longer complete the time and type of infrastructure projects that are commonplace across Europe? Why, since 2012, have decision times for national infrastructure soared by 65% now taking four years? And why have our railways plunged down the World Economic Forum's International League rankings to sit between India and Kazakhstan in infrastructure quality? The blame is not with British builders, with British industry, or with British workers. It's with this government. And that is why my party has launched an independent expert review of transport infrastructure headed by Jürgen Mayer to learn lessons from this decade of failure and stagnation and to ensure that the next Labour government 
can deliver transport infrastructure faster, more effectively, and to budget. As part of this, we are committed to removing barriers in our archaic planning system to back the builders, not the blockers. And we will end the chaos and confusion by providing clarity and certainty of policy. We will listen to the experts, drawing from the brightest and the best from around the world to learn lessons on delivering transport infrastructure fit for the century ahead. That is the approach I believe our rail industry, our country, and our passengers deserve. And by learning those lessons and providing clear direction, we will deliver a credible and transformative program of transport infrastructure investment for passengers and for freight within our fiscal rules, replacing the current Victorian era infrastructure that is holding our communities back and building connectivity between Liverpool and Hull and across the north. But of course, it's not just the infrastructure that has been so politicised and as a result, left in paralysis. The same could be said for our entire railway system, where we currently see no coordination and no coherent plan. And 30 years after privatisation, it is passengers who have to deal with the consequences. Too often, passengers tell me that their train was late, overcrowded or cancelled, that they aren't able to get a seat, or that there aren't clean and functioning toilets, and that they aren't getting value for money for fares. Now, none of this is controversial to say. In fact, the government openly admits that the system is failing, which is why they commissioned the Williams Review way back in 2018. Yet half a decade and nearly a full parliament later, the costs of reform are going up, without anything to show for it, thanks to repeated delays. The government today revealed that the expected costs of their reform plans have risen from £205 million to £381 million, and they could rise even further. And as we still don't know when the government expects Great British Railways to be established, it's therefore right to question whether this is a turning into another DFT project where costs are rapidly spiralling out of control with nothing to show for it. Now, we live in a time when a successful rail network couldn't be more critical for jobs, for connectivity, productivity and growth, which makes these delays to reform all the more unforgivable. Now, I don't know whether it's because the Prime Minister prefers to travel by helicopter than by rail, but his head is in the clouds on this, and he seems to have simply accepted the managed decline of our railways. Now, this lack of leadership and inertia in decision-making has fractured responsibility for innovation and chronically delayed passenger improvements. But it doesn't have to be this way, because with Labour, change is coming. We will deliver the biggest reform of public transport in more than a generation, taking control out the hands of Whitehall officials and into the hands of industry experts and giving accountability back to the public where it belongs. In places of a fractured, fragmented chaos we see today, we will deliver a unified rail network with pas passengers at the heart, bringing our railways back into public ownership as contracts expire. Now, examples from around the world tell us that with the right structure and the right incentives, we can see railways that help drive better and greener growth across every region across our country. Now, our plan is driven by pragmatism, by the need to end the fragmentation, inefficiency and waste, which sees very few winners, but millions of passengers and taxpayers losing out. In contrast to the current system, under Labour's plans, everything will be tested, uh, tested against delivering for the passenger. We will end the system of micromanagement from Whitehall and the day-to-day -day tinkering by ministers to deliver a truly passenger-focused railway with a single guiding mind. Now, whether it's Emma who commutes to work from Scarborough or Luke who travels to school in Southampton or any passenger across our country, they will know that the railways are being run for them. Our railway system, once the envy of the world, is now in crisis and is not living up to the huge potential, potential to deliver for passengers 
and potential to deliver for our economy. Urgent and major reform is needed. And I promise you that with the next Labour government, it is coming. We will put our railways back on track to sustainable growth and improvement, and we will deliver for passengers again. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Public ownership as contracts expire. Labour no longer wants that for energy or water. Rachel Reeves has run her red pen through that one. But for rail, you do still want it. And I'm interested in why. What's the evidence it would be cheaper or better? So um, I, we agree with lots of the recommendations of the Williams Review. Um, and what we want to do is to, to build on that. Where we differ is that we do believe that public ownership is the answer to the analysis that we've reviewed. And I don't think we can say after the last 30 years it's been a successful time. And what we want to do is to make sure that we've got a single guided mind um, with a public body that essentially puts passengers at the very heart of everything that is we Is that do. in every case? Because I'm aware there'll be some people in the room worried that you might put them out of the job if you get into government. If an operator is meeting all their targets, at the end of the contract, they will still be public ownership, whatever the outcome. So the issue, we think, is around the fragmentation of the current network. So we're focused on passenger services. So we're not talking about not freight. Not freight, or... not the people who own the trains, That's just right. passenger services. That's absolutely right. And we know that certainly in terms of the efficiencies and waste that we've seen, certainly from the Williams Review research, that actually that would generate 1.5 billion of efficiencies. And of course, in terms of the costings for the arm's length body, that's already in the government's baseline. So that's what we're committed to doing. And, and obviously, it's a, a policy that's hugely popular amongst the public because we know that it will improve the experience for passengers. But what about the costs of doing it? Because Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves told us two years ago, Labour's changed, Labour's pro-business now, and we don't, these are her words, want billions of pounds to spend billions of pounds nationalising things. If you're a rail user and you're looking at you know, a fair increase in March of nearly 5%, why should you look at Labour's plans and think that will mean we won't see those increases in future? Because we will uh, essentially bring the service back into house when contracts expire, so that it means it's cost neutral. But as I said earlier, also with the Williams uh, review, the learning is that because of the fragmentation, because of the duplication, because of the waste and inefficiency, we will generate 1.5 billion of savings. So you believe it will save money and it won't cost money to, to set up. It's another sort of top-down reorganisation, essentially. Well, the government will agree that we need to see change in, in, in railways and, and the reform agenda. You know, Hugh's come here today after five mm -hmm. years of, of those proposals coming forward. It's great that we've got the, the lecture today so that those announcements can be made, but we've got to just get on with it and make sure... Uh, we improve the experience for all passengers. The draft rail bill talks about unleashing the power of the private sector. So you disagree with that part of it? We see a role for the private sector and in due course we've set out the role for the private sector in, in unlocking investment across the country. Thank you very much. Now we will open it up to your questions in a moment. But first, I'm going to ask Hugh and Stephen to ask each other a question. Hugh, <laughs> do you want to go first? Let me first. <laughs> Where could this go? What have you got for dinner? Um, <laughs> <laughs> about uh, rail, about rail. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you about HS2, if I may, because you were critical of the decision, and the Prime Minister set his stall out. Uh, he, uh, he is going to deliver investment across all of the regions rather than just focusing on that one particular aspect. Um, and you were critical of that, and I understand it. On that basis, you could commit to reversing that decision but your leader went up to Manchester and said that that wouldn't be taken place either, despite the fact the land sales wouldn't be sold. So what I want to know is, if it's not going ahead under Labour, then are you still going to commit to the new station for Bradford, the mass transit system for Leeds, the electrification at Hull uh, and Sheffield? Are all those projects that we are working on for those regions safe if Labour comes into power? Thanks, Hugh. Uh, a question I expected you to ask with me uh, tonight. Um, let's be clear, I think the government's handling on HS2 has been absolutely shambolic. The cooking up of the solution in a conference room in Manchester and then announced at a former railway station, I think is a good example of really bad government communications. 
we, you know, you've blown a, a, a huge hole in the finances around HS2, so we don't know what we will inherit coming into government. But, and I'm not going to be the person today that's going to make promises that we can't keep because I think people have uh, seen those promises broken too often from this government. And that's why we want to be responsible and to understand the situation that we will inherit. But obviously it's very clear that we do need to improve connectivity across that part of the network and also improve uh, capacity too. And that's why we will work with our elected mayors and our local leaders to find a solution that works for our country. So not sure about HS2. Uh, what question have you got for Hugh? So Hugh, it's been five years since your government commissioned the Williams Review. Since then, we've seen the biggest national uh, rail strike in decades, the highest level of train cancellations on record, and the government having to step in to take rail franchises <coughs> off numerous failed operators because of poor performance. And despite this constant chaos, late last year, the Transport Secretary said that it was unlikely that legislation to implement your proposed rail reforms would be passed before the general election. So as Tamara said, a really simple question, will you pass the rail reform bill before the next general election, yes or no? Well, actually, you might be able to help me with that one yeah. because the question is, are you going to support it? Because you talked about having a guiding mind, integrating. That's exactly what this bill does. Uh, it doesn't talk about whether it should be private sector or public sector actually operating the trains. That's not in the scope of legislation. So with your help, then we can make this go much, much so faster. So what's the time so scale you're working if we can, Well, I'm, I'm, royal I, I want to go as fast as you can, Stephen, on this. Because but you're if, you are serious you're about, if you are serious about wanting to integrate and do all the things you set up there, then work with me to get that through the pre-legislative scrutiny so that we together can actually make the case for the earliest implementation through legislation. So who knows what's possible if you and I work together to make it happen? So what's the time scale? Just one question, just question. one question. <laughs> He's not answered the question. <laughs> he hasn't really answered the question. So, so Twice. But, but, well, I, I, in that particular sense, I'm relying on the uh, pre-legislative scrutiny by the select committee, which I expect will have happened uh, by summer, but that's down to Ian and his committee. Wouldn't be for me uh, to tell the chair when that should be done. So but if, if, it gets cross party the summer, if it gets cross-party consensus, when do you want then Wallace we can send? land it quickly. And the other thing, of course, as I know, and you will actually, you will end up learning it if you're fortunate enough to be in this position, is that it's not the rail minister that actually sets what's inside a king's speech. Uh, that is actually down to the prime minister. But I will be making the case, with I hope your support, for the fact that it's ready, and if there's a slot, let's use it and let's make this happen. Right, we're going to open up to the audience questions, and the first question, uh, I'd like to ask Steve Montgomery, the chair of Rail Partners, to ask our first question. Uh, thank you, thank Stephen for the debate. I suppose for yourself first, Hugh, obviously we've said legislation is really important and you know, once we get that through, you would look to quickly get contracts. How quickly do you think contracts can get out into the private sector again to make sure that we can deliver something for the customer again, which we all feel we're restrained at the moment because obviously the situation after the pandemic. And Stephen, to you, obviously your opposition to private sector is something from a private sector company, we're obviously very much opposed to. We believe that we've grown the industry since privatisation, and as you indicated earlier, we've doubled passenger numbers. So it's an ideology at this moment in time, or do you believe you can work with the private sector to harness what we have done in previous years to try and make it better for the customer out there? Or is it just a straight, it's going to be a, a nationalised industry? Yep. No, actually, in a way, this is where collaboration works with all of us. So we sat down some time back and talked about the, the, the private sector uh, rail operators being able to take on more risk, uh, to get more reward, uh, to actually have incentives again to do that. And there were talk about it takes a while to actually put the new contracts in place, tendering law, etc., can take up to three years. And so what we agreed we'd do is look at our existing contracts and amend them, and that's exactly what's happened. So we're on the start of that journey. There is a three-year process to put the actual national contracts together so we can put them out to market, like we did under franchising, and get bidders, uh, and then get the best bid in place. Uh, we are working on that already, but what I want to do is actually continue to work under the existing contract regime. So as your appetite gets greater, because we get more passengers back onto the railway, then we can amend them further and allow you to do even more, rather than just waiting for the three-year period. 
And that's the kind of dynamic that we have because we work together rather than against each other. Uh, Stephen, is it ideological? Um, so I think what we've got to do is end the dogma and be more pragmatic. And absolutely, there is a role. Is it nationalising dogma in itself? No. I mean, look at look at what happens across Europe. There are plenty of European countries that have state-run um, rail services or part-run. I mean, the vast majority of Euro European countries do have that. So. This is not about ideology, it's about what works, and that's why we want to build an evidence and work with the private sector around innovation and investment, and we will set out much more detail on that in due course. Next question is Steve Murphy of MTR. Thanks very much. Um, first of all, to both our speakers, thanks very much for being here tonight. I really respect the fact you've turned up and, and opened yourself up to the conversation. Um, just to lighten the mood, it's a question about industrial relations. Um, <laughs> and not, and not, not just for Hugh, actually. I know he's been grappling with this uh, for some time, as, as many of us have. So very keen to get Stephen's views. And after, it was referenced earlier, but after the billions of pounds lost in passenger revenue and damage to the wider economy, and a particular concern of mine, a growing dislocation between the frontline staff who run the railway and the management of the railway, what is it that, as operators, we need to do to finally resolve this dispute and get the industry back to work? Crucial question, Hugh. Industrial action, as left, we know, is still in dispute with the train companies. What would you... Are you going to let them carry on? Well, I mean, currently the ball is in their court, and we have to... We have a duty to the taxpayer, uh, and a duty also to, to reduce inflation that impacts the most vulnerable in this country if inflation runs right. So we have to be... We have to ask the unions to be reasonable, uh, and by giving them uh, a pay increase that would take an average train driver's salary from £60,000 to £65,000 for their existing 35-hour week, in return for reform so we can deliver a seven-day railway so the passenger actually gets those improvements. I believe that is entirely fair and reasonable, not least because that's a very similar deal that has been accepted by three other unions, uh, and it's not fair on them when they've actually done the right thing and been willing to negotiate and actually make those uh, you know, amends towards us if we then give more to those actually that get the paid the most and barrel us out the last. That's you, just not fair. Are you fair. going to be seeing Asleth? They say they haven't seen a minister in a year. We know they've rejected your pay offer and it's slightly less than what the RMT were offered. The government don't do the negotiations, but you've set the envelope for them. So, yeah. so do, you the think, do you think it's worth offering them more in the hope that passengers don't have another several months of disruption? So again, I look back on it, we've also got another, a number of other uh, pay disputes across the sector. And of course, there's a knock-on effect. So if we pay even more than the 60 to 65,000 pounds, then quite rightly, the nurses, the teachers are gonna continue to ask for more. They don't earn anything like that in most instances, and that's not fair on them. So we have to set that bar. And the fact is that the, the unions, uh, and I'd like to see, hear Stephen's views on this, because I will absolutely condemn the industrial action. It is ruinous uh, towards the railway. Um, and it, the ball is in the union's court. And I know, I heard Mick Whelan's frustration in terms of how dare we end up just making him an offer and setting out all the parameters. That was because we weren't getting any engagement from them whatsoever. So yes, absolutely it was mandated that we need to put this offer down because we need to know what the union's next move is going to be. But if you're telling me should we be paying even more than 65,000 pounds for a 35 hour, four day week, when you consider that the passengers that are being carried will be on average 28,000 pounds, and they're the ones with increased fares that are paying those salaries. So that's then it. No, I if don't they think want that's to fair. carry on um, having industrial action until the elections, then you're not offering Look, them a penny more. We are not going to let in, uh, the, the reductions we've got on inflation go in reverse, because when you do that, inflation makes the most vulnerable the poorest, and that's not something that we're willing to do. Train drivers are very well paid, and ultimately I want them to think of how we can run a seven-day railway more efficiently so that management can properly roster staff where they know they are needed. I mean, fancy Tesco's opening up on a Sunday and not being sure whether they'll have any staff uh, unless there's the goodwill in place. That is not unreasonable to change. The way our system works is we can only get there by agreement. I want the unions to play their part and modernise and help us improve rail rather than keep holding us backwards. Stephen, you might inherit this dispute and we know that the unions are going to be pushing very hard um, for increased pay and limited changes to working conditions. Would Labour give in? Thanks for the lighter question. Mm. Um, 
as, as we just heard, you know, there is a standoff that is just not helpful for anyone, and we need to get to a stage where industrial action is resolved, you know, the longest running dispute in, in, in decades. We would take a consciously different approach, working with trade unions and negotiating, getting around the room to then negotiate on a deal. Yeah, I think it's shameful ministers haven't met with ASLEF since Christmas 2022. So we've got to find a deal that works and, and finally settle this dispute. And, that, and that's going to be, that's going to involve, they want to see a higher offer, but they also are holding out against Sunday working and some of the reforms the government have proposed. Do you think that they have a leg to stand on there? Well, I'm not over the details because I'm obviously not part of the negotiations, but I think it's really important that ministers sit around the room with ASLEF and negotiate a deal that works for our country. I just pick up on that. I mean, the thought that Mick Whelan want to come around and have a cup of tea and just chat, you know, how football's going, is unrealistic. What they're looking for is no reform and more pay. So it's quite a simple, straightforward point. Is that something that you're actually going to be engaging with? Because you talked about your fiscal rules, um, in which case you can't have it both ways. So, you know, it's, it's all well and good to say, we'll sit down and talk. But actually, the, the real point is, when he asks you for more money, and given your close links with ASLEV, are you in a position to be able to settle it because you're going to give them more money, in which case, where are your fiscal rules? Quick, I'm not going to sit down talking about football and drink cups of tea, mm -hmm. but I would do is sit down and have serious conversations about the future of our railways to avoid in further industrial action. Next question is Patrick Verver of Rail Go Ahead. <laughs> Good. Safety first. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, moving off the oh, probably the rail topic uh, uh, slightly. Um, a question for Stephen, because uh, I, I think you, I know your answer and you've been very clear about it. Um, the go ahead have just entered a partnership with Andy Burnham in Greater Manchester to operate the B network. Is there scope in your, in Labour's plans to adopt a similar partnership model, um, basically providing public accountability, but using the private sector uh, to provide innovation and deliver for customers? Is that a model you're interested in? Andy Burnham's doing it, Sadiq Khan's doing it in London? So I think it's really important that we learn from what works across the country and I think what has been absent in recent years is that lack of engagement with our metro mayors and local leaders to make sure we've got a better connected country that builds the capacity that we need for the future. Um, I'm off to Manchester soon to learn more about what the B network's doing and obviously we want to see uh, much closer working between rail and bus as much as possible. We will set out a lot more detail around what relationship we will have with the private sector when we announce our rail reform proposals in due course. So despite your commitment to public ownership, if Andy Burnham wants to do it in Manchester and Sadiq Khan wants to do that in London, they can? Well, I think one of the issues that comes up time and time again is that fragmentation, and that's why we see the value in an arm's length body that commissions the services across the country, and that's what obviously we will set out more detail about in due course. Uh, we've got a question on freight from Andrea Rossi of DB Cargo. Yes, thank you. Good evening. And thankfully we can talk a little bit about freight now, <laughs> which is really well. So I'm glad to have that opportunity. So as you know, the uh, logistics market is a highly competitive one, uh, and our customers have multiple modes of transport to, to choose from. You now, since privatization, freight operating companies have invested about three billion pounds uh, into the industry to make it become what it is today. And we work really, really hard uh, to create and deliver for our customers uh, uh, and our shareholders uh, in a very, very competitive environment. Now, um, as rail costs go up, and they're going up proportionally quicker than road costs, this is becoming more and more challenging for us. So my question to you both uh, is, how will your respective parties level the playing field between rail and road over the next five years and what assurances can you give us, freight operating companies, that you'll maintain that private sector investment coming into the rail sector in the UK? Thank you. Hugh, do you want to go first? I know one of the criticisms of HS2 being cancelled, the northern leg, was where's that capacity and how will it take lorries off the road? Yeah, but again, coming back to it, what we're doing is reallocating the monies to invest in projects that will give more freight paths. So it's a question of choices. 
Um, but just come back to Andrea's point. And Andrea, you were in the room with me. So every other month, I sit down with the freight um, uh, businesses and with Maggie uh, as the chair of the umbrella group and Network Rail. And we work out what we can do to open up more opportunities for freight. It's something I'm really, really passionate about. Um, and the industry are fantastic. Um, and I mentioned the port of Southampton, so I think this is a brilliant idea. We want to put more pressure on our ports. And as Andrea knows, uh, we actually had all the ports represented. So basically, the port of Southampton, end up ch you end up getting charged more if you move freight by road. But if you move it by rail, you actually claw that back. And it's uh, succeeding. So my challenge to every other port is you should be doing exactly the same, because uh, I'm particularly interested in that. And the other thing we've done, it's very regrettable, the SNP have just uh, axed the uh, modal shift grant that's given. Um, so we have stepped in to at least give you the funds for the year where there's cross-border, so we'll pay their share as well as our own. Uh, but we will continue with, with that support. Um, and what I really want to do is we actually see there are certain sort of issues around demand with passenger numbers. The first question I always ask my officials is, can we open that up for freight? Is that the right path for freight? Um, and we will continue to, to look at the timetable, also look at all the enhancements to make sure that we open up more freight paths, because that's the way to get it through. Stephen, what does, would Labour do to help freight stay competitive? I absolutely agree with lots of things Hugh's just said, and Maggie's always very good at reminding me to make sure I talk about freight as well as passengers. Um, it's so vital to grow our economy. It's so vital for the decarbonisation agenda. We need to see freight grow, and you know we will always support initiatives that, that allow that to happen. So I agree with what Hugh said. Can we have a question from Mary Grant of Porterbrook? Thank you very much. Okay, so what is great is you both agree passionately about putting the passengers first, and we've just had the question on freight, so this is about passengers. I'm going to come to you, Hugh, because it's in, within your gift, but we talk about uh, your commitments on the, in the main of the Wilmot Review, and it's about 30-year integrated systems. But there is another elephant in the room, Andy talked about too earlier, and it's rolling stock. It's great about the commitment, the 20 billion that has been invested in rolling stock since privatization, the 8,000 vehicles that have come into the network. But there's some statistics recognizing the length of time it's taking procurements from start to finish that is gonna have a profound impact on the customers. So if you're genuinely um, concerned, as I know you are passionately about putting passengers first, these are some serious statistics. Notwithstanding what we've all read and seen and experiencing with the manufacturing challenges and the supply chain impact, but this famine, feast, feast, famine approach has got some potential catastrophic incidents coming down the road. There are two and a half thousand vehicles currently need, will come off the network by 2030. And it's not because you want to take them off, it's because of really obsolescence, life at it, ending, etc. At the moment, it is taking between six and seven years from start to finish for seeing services coming in. That means that we are gonna compress we're going to um, cause even further demand. You're talking about passengers not getting seats, not feeling comfortable, um, trains being reliable. We've got a real problem. Now, your pipeline that you publish here is great to see. It's billions, and it's very committed and commendable. But the time it's going to take, you're saying maybe the first contract, maybe, might be signed by the end of this year, many coming thereafter. This doesn't need reform. This doesn't need legislation. This doesn't need a change. It might need some cross-party support, but I don't think it even needs that. We could get on with increasing, sorry. Mary, can I push you towards a question for these two? Sorry, but it's for you. We could get on now. No, the, you need to really, we all need to know the, under, or we all know the background. We need to get on with doing parallel competitions now and not waiting them in sequential order because we're going to run out of train carriages for our customers in the future by 2030. Um, before you answer that question on rolling stock, I'm just going to take another question, and you can do both at once if that's all right. Um, can we hear from David Brown from Arriva? Hi, thank you. Um, we heard in Hugh's speech the importance uh, that open access operators, Grand Central, Lumo, and Hall Trains play in linking communities, particularly in the north uh, of England and Scotland as well as providing innovative um, customer-based services that really drive growth. So my question really for Stephen is, what's the role for open access operators under a Labour government 
And Hugh, we know that you're passionate about open access and you said you're looking to free up capacity and make the process quicker. And when will that actually happen, please? Thank you. Can we start with um, Stephen on rolling stock and open access? Yeah, so I think the consequences of that steady pipeline of work uh, to industry is having consequences. And obviously, we've had real challenges around uh, Alstom and, and Hitachi recently. So I hear when I talk to the sector, the real challenges around the feast and famine that we currently see. I had similar conversations when I had the shadow defence brief and some of the challenges that would bring in terms of bringing forward work. What I hear from the sector is that we need clarity and we need consistency from government so that businesses know when to invest, and that's something that I have been raising with Hugh and others uh, in Parliament and will continue to do so. Um, and obviously, in recent uh, challenges, we need to just see that procurement being brought forward so that uh, organisations can bid for that competitively. And with regards to open access, uh, obviously, I recognise it's, it's a tiny proportion currently of the rail network, um, but we're not ideological about it and, and see you know, there is value, and therefore we will set out more details about that in, in our rail reform work in due course. Yeah. Yeah, so Mary, um, I, I do take the point in terms of actually making sure that there's a smooth process through and it's something that I've sat down with the four train manufacturers to, to get their feedback and try and see how we can deliver to that. You know, off the back of the amazing growth through privatisation, through uh, increased passenger numbers, revenues, then you know, large numbers of orders, we've now got four fantastic uh, train manufacturers and there is of course a struggle now because um, as those orders have slowed down, the fleet has got younger uh, and and obviously now there's more to, to try and sort of spread out in terms of giving that support it is proving that challenge but one of the things they ask of me is we need certainty in terms of what the tendering process is going to be and it's not then going to be cancelled uh, and we're committed to that the secretary of state has written uh, to all of the roscoes uh, to actually talk about matters that can be brought forward so we can provide that support because there is that particular sort of sweet spot where there is real challenges for rolling stock uh, producers, we have to understand that. So your point is a fair one, we are looking to address it. Um, and in terms of open access, yeah, look, we had a fantastic uh, session with the industry uh, and the ORR, Network Rail, it was brilliant, uh, back in November where we talked about what can we do to get more open access applications through and make it faster and easier for them to be processed. Um, so Network Rail and the ORR have agreed a set of timescales, so that process, again, it almost comes back to Mary's point, so you know how long it's actually going to take, what the steps are going to be, um, we've gone through an exercise of looking at unused slots. Uh, those, uh, the doll operators have actually already sort of gone through that exercise. Private sector are doing that at the moment. Uh, and I'm particularly keen that we can sort of offer up uh, a sort of suite of open access uh, journeys so that we can actually get bidders to come in. The amazing thing about open access, I went to Lumo. Yeah, and I know this may seem like, like absolutely standard for any workplace, but you go into Lumo and you end up sitting down with the management and the drivers who are being trained up in the same building. Mm. You, and that is the frustrating thing about the railway. In other parts of it, the management aren't allowed to talk to those that actually work <laughs> in rail. They have to start their shift all over again. And open access gives us the opportunity to really learn and do things differently and rebuild. And what I'd say to Stephen, if open access is all right, uh, and Andy Burnham's Sadiq Khan's model is all right, why can't you just pay a fee for the private sector who know best, in my view, how to deliver to run the train operations across the country. Uh, we'll take a question from Dominic Booth from Transport UK. Where's Dominic? Thank you. Um, I don't think there's ever been a time where our operators have had their faces turned so far away from the passenger and looking so inwardly. Uh, having, see, having to seek permission uh, at every turn for just the uh, smallest decision. Uh, and I think, you know, I think we all in this room can see that's very un a very unhealthy situation. So my question to you both is, you know, in terms of the, uh, the structures that you intend to put in place, whether it's Great British Railways or a, a, you know, a, monop a more monopolistic state control organisation, what is it specifically? Can you be specific? What is it that's going to enable and incentivize the operators to turn their faces urgently back towards the passenger so that revenues can be grown most quickly, costs under control, and our great railways can realize their full potential. Thank you. Okay, how do we do that, Hugh? By again, harnessing the private sector. I mean, I, I, the idea of making profits is not a dirty word. It's a positive because it means that every single day people go into the workplace 
to do right by the passenger because that will also have a knock-on and actually increase uh, their own profits. And that's exactly what we saw during privatisation, the doubling of passenger numbers in 20 years. Great for the passenger because all that rolling stock I just talked about has been created. We were able to uh, increase the number of services. Great for the private sector, great for shareholders, great for pensions, great for the workforce that grew with that, all because people were incentivised and enthused to be entrepreneurial and grow their businesses and grow rail. And that's what we've missed since the pandemic. Of course, it's a challenge because, as I said, we've lost 20% of our finances, so it's not as lucrative. But we need to rebuild that model back. You know, and that's why I look back to the success that I describe, and that's the best template to actually regrow our railways post the pandemic. But I'm sure Stephen will tell us that there were pro quite a lot of problems before the pandemic with the introduction of the new timetable, revealed all sorts of problems beneath the surface. What do you think is the answer? So I think what we've got to do is make sure that the new arm's length bodies, focus, strategy, targets are all set on improving the experience for passengers and we need to end the micromanagement that we see currently coming from Whitehall and from the DFT. And that means a role for the Secretary of State to be the passenger in chief in driving that change that we need to say, see with the unified rail network. And I think sometimes we lose um, the focus on passengers when we end up talking a lot more about engineering or the fragmentation or the dither and delay that we've seen on rail reform and also the blame culture that we've seen in, in the sector. And that's got to change. Now, I believe we have some journalists in the audience over here. If any of you would like to um, ask a question, please um, put your hands up. Uh, yes, in the front row. Uh, Christian Warmer. Um, Hugh, uh, I just wonder, is it a good idea to double the prices of people using the railway if they want to travel between London, Newcastle, London, Edinburgh, and just want to walk up and uh, buy a ticket. I mean, is this the end of the walk-up railway? Is that kind of the big plan? Uh, I think you're referring, Christian, to demand-based uh, pricing, which is a trial, uh, in the same way that the single-leg pricing was a trial, which has actually allowed people effectively to get half the, the price in terms of ticket revenue. It's a trial. So, of course, and this is going to be the challenge when we all talk about fair simplification. You will always, when you're bringing in one band, for example, and we see this on pay-as-you-go, there will be some people that are then paying a little more for their ticket because you've just standardised it but you've made it simpler. And there are others that will actually pay less. And actually, we have to be brave here because as MPs, we know this, do we not, Stephen? We tend to only hear from those people that aren't quite as happy with the, the deal rather than those that actually are really happy with it. And then sometimes we don't actually follow through on it. And actually, we've got to have to be brave. But there are people but who work shifts, who have to travel at certain times of the day, who don't have loads of flexibility, and it may be those people on low incomes who lose out. Well, I mean, it's always been more expensive uh, to buy a ticket on the day than to uh, do advanced purchases. I mean, we have some of the cheapest rail tickets across Europe if you look at the advanced purchase way. But we have decided to do a trial to see if demand-based pricing works on the railway. It's not to actually increase mm. revenue. It's to actually see if we can get more backsides on seats. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work out, then we'll end the trial. If it does work out, then we'll actually continue it or we'll modify it. That's what reform is all about. You've got to try these things, otherwise <coughs> we'll never change. Um, any other journalist questions before we open it up to everybody else? Do you want me to respond to Ben Clapworthy from The Times. You, you speak to the train operating companies, what, daily, weekly? How often? I don't speak to them daily. I speak to them. I mean, that's the whole idea. They're, they're there to actually run the train services, and if they perform, they get their fee. If they don't, they don't get that performance fee. So I, I, I speak to them when we need to speak. On minimum service levels, you said the public need reliable and, cons uh, and consistent services and any strike action should not disproportionately impact this. Relevant rail employers now are able to make use of minimum service levels as soon as these regulations come into force. They are, they didn't. Why did they not use them? So all of those things you actually made in terms of the readiness is absolutely the case. Our job is to make sure that the industry, and that also includes network rail, is ready uh, should the train operators uh, decide uh, to use them. Under the terms of the legislation, it's a decision for the employer. Now that employer, whether it's LNER, Northern, being the, the doll, the public sector employers, they take that decision. They are responsible for safety on the railways, they are responsible for making the decision about what's best for the passenger and their workforce, and that's a decision uh, for them. Uh, and that's on the legislation. Our job is to make sure that they're ready, 
to use them if they choose to use them, and that's what we've focused on. Of course, we wouldn't actually need them if we didn't have industrial action in the first place, and if we actually had the reform that we need, uh, then we wouldn't be in this situation where we're talking about minimum service levels because we wouldn't have strikes. Do you want to comment on either of those things? Yeah, Stephen? just briefly. Um, I mean, I'm conscious there's something like 55 million different types of tickets on the rail network. So I do agree with Hugh that we need to see a simplified fare system and a simpler ticketing system. It, it's complex at the moment. Yeah. What I hear from the sector is real concerns around some really good innovation that then don't see through to delivery. And I know that that's a real frustration. What I would want to see an incoming Labour government do is make sure that every passenger gets the best possible fare at the cheapest possible cost. And on MSL, we warn the government of, of this just not going to work, uh, you know, as we saw in most recent industrial action. That's why obviously Labour's committed to repealing that legislation. We'll take um, questions from the audience. I'll try and take as many as I can, perhaps um, <coughs> two at a time. Um, should we take one from the gentleman here and then one um, <coughs> uh, from the gentleman on the uh, fourth row from the back? We could keep them as quick as possible. That would be great. Hi, uh, Neil Mansfield from the Press Association. A question for Stephen: Will fares be lower under a Labour government? Sorry, say that again. I didn't catch it. Will fares be lower under yeah. a Labour government? Will they be lower? Um, we will set out our uh, reform proposals in due course. But what I will say is, obviously, we want to keep our central focus on improving the experience for passengers. But I can't say more. By than charging that them now. less money. Obviously, I can't you say think more they than must, that, now that must be the aim. You, you've Rachel said Reeves before, be haven't happy. you, that um, it would lower fares and improve the service? We, yeah, I mean, there's huge challenges that face, as I mentioned earlier, you know, real challenges around fares and, and ticketing that needs to be simplified. We want to make sure passengers get the best possible fare. Do you think that a nationalised railway would produce lower fares? Uh, no, because I think uh, the blend we've actually got in terms of private sector, and also I hasten to add four very good. Uh, doll operators that run in, in the same way that the business is. What we have tried to do is to split the balance between the UK taxpayer uh, and the fair uh, payer. So the latest increase, 4.9%, whilst it may seem high, it would have actually been 9%. So it's trying to share the balance between the UK taxpayer, many of whom may not use rail, uh, and the rail passenger to ensure that they are within an affordable range. Yes, next question. Hi, Darren Kaplan, Rail Industry Association. Uh, we commissioned STEER, the industri uh, industrial uh, 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 consultancy on infrastructure, to do some work on passenger numbers, and they produced a report yesterday that showed, come up to 2050, passenger numbers will increase by between 37% and 97%, depending on when the government does nothing or whether they take certain actions. They also said that passenger numbers today are 90% plus, which goes against uh, some of the figures that come out. And I'm wondering why uh, Prime Minister, when he made some out on HS2, used a figure of 74% to justify the scrapping of HS2, when that figure is not recognised by anyone. So we have figures showing they're 90% now. We have figures going forward saying we, it's going to grow between 37 and 97%. Why is the government using figures that aren't recognised? Shall we take another question and then we can do two, a couple at once? Uh, there's one down here. Hi, Paul Tui, Campaign for Better Transport. Just going back to the earlier question about costs and tickets to try and drive modal shift, it strikes me that there's a really, really simple answer that and it's staring us in the face, and that is that the other modes of transport, which are the filthiest, seem to be the cheapest, and travelling by rail, which is the greatest, cleanest way of moving about, consistently gets higher. So why don't you just tax one and pay the other and everybody's happy? <laughs> uh, Hugh, should we start with you? Um, Passenger numbers might double. Why didn't the Prime Minister acknowledge it? We use the ORR figures that come out every quarter. Uh, now, what they do show uh, is uh, the percentage with Elizabeth Line, without the Elizabeth Line, which is about, around about 10% of all of our rail journeys. So, look, I don't know, Darren. I'll have to take that away, uh, and I would happily write to you in terms of what, what figures are what. But I did see uh, your report, and I welcome it. And that is the point. Uh, again, it comes back to rail reform. We know that we're going to have got a growing clientele, a lot of younger people, I include my younger people, uh, that <laughs> my, my kids are, are actually sort of preferring rail, like you, uh, Stephen, uh, to actually taking their test. So we actually know we've got a captive market. It's the green, clean, comfortable way to be able to travel. So we know we've got a growing market there. That's why we need to integrate track and train, deliver it more efficiently, 
move matters outside of the Department for Transport and actually set the industry free to take advantage of these increased numbers that Darren's research rightly highlights. Um, Stephen, green, clean, but very, very expensive. What would you say? Um, I think there's huge potential for rail. Uh, I think we can do more to encourage people that are concerned about their carbon footprint that want to offer something back to tackle the climate crisis to encourage them in, into rail. And I think that's absolutely the priority of an incoming Labour government. I joined a focus group recently with men in their 30s and, and, and 40s to kind of find out their experience of why they don't use rail. And it's partly about the reliability, it's partly about the cost. So, you know, we've got to listen and, and learn from that generation to understand what we can do to get them back on the trains again. One of the things I best see and I would agree with, so I had a conversation with Tesco. They move their goods by freight. And obviously every single, well, not every single UK, UK <laughs> Uh, person, but um, you know the UK taxpayer benefits because they buy their their goods in that particular way. So you know the point I want to know is why are the other supermarkets, why are other businesses that have got all these green credentials to say they're going to reduce their carbon footprint? We've got to really put them onto <coughs> rail because this is a way for them to deliver their targets, and too many of them are getting away with it by using dirty uh, roads, which is actually road haulage, which is no good for the quality of the roads or congestion or the environment. Um, you can take 129 HGVs off the road with one freight train. And so we, all of us need to work together to get those companies to get their goods off lorry and onto rail You trains. announced a freight target recently, but it's not until 2050. Is that showing So the, the beauty of that, and actually you talk to someone inside Network Rail, is that where you've actually got a target that's there, you've actually got to grow and you've got to deliver for it. And actually that's one of the things across government was like, oh, hang on, we're now going to all need to spend more money in order to ensure that freight meets that target. Yeah, that's great. That's exactly what we actually want uh, to be the case. And that will also be the case for the sector as a whole. So of course with Network Rail and the team that work brilliantly within freight and Network Rail, they will have now much bigger clout because they've got to deliver to those targets. We all have to. And Great British Rail Transition Team have got their, will have their strategic uh, freight team set up to actually help deliver that, to help the freight, private sector in freight to do such a great job grow even more. Any other questions? Um, yes, uh, the lady down here, and um, and this gentleman there. Thank you, uh, Nina. What, what are intuitive talent solutions? Um, all of the stuff that we've heard tonight is great. I think we're hearing some really positive things from from both sides <coughs> of the stage, as it were. Um, we hear a lot about track and train. My focus is very much on people. I've spoken to you both at different occasions about the MSAR report that came out at the end of last year. The industry's got an ageing workforce, we've known that for some time. We've got 75,000 people who are eligible for retirement in the next five years, and less than 4% of the workforce of the rail industry is aged 25 or younger. What will your government policy do to attract more people into the UK rail industry? because we can't deliver any of this if we haven't got the people at the front line in the middle management and senior management roles to deliver what the passenger wants us to deliver. Stephen, is that issue on your radar? Yeah, so obviously Bridget Phillipson set out our plans for skills, which I think is a significant generational challenge that we face. We've got to encourage uh, young people to uh, go to university, develop degree apprentices and, and other routes into the jobs that they need for the future. You know, choosing those paths to success is absolutely vital for young people. Uh, I want to see a divers diversification of the sector too, and we've got to invest uh, in young people to encourage them to go into STEM opportunities and into uh, the rail sector too. Um, we were talking earlier about the value of you know, the jobs in decarbonisation and electrification as well should be brilliant opportunities for young women to go into those uh, industries as well. Hugh, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah, Nina, I, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, 16% of the workforce is, is female, which is absolutely hopeless in that sense, albeit growing. But actually, I look around the room uh, and I see the role models uh, that aren't, aren't me and aren't Stephen. <laughs> um, they are people like you. Um, they are Lucy, the Chief Constable of British Transport Police. They're Mary at Porterbrook who spoke. There's Angie. I'm sorry, there's lots of others. Uh, I'm going to now get in trouble. Um, but actually, <laughs> so there are more uh, in that sense. Jack, who I was with earlier on. Um, you are the ones that are actually going to inspire people to, to join the rail industry because you have made it to the top 
uh, of your particular profession. And that's what I want you to be doing, not me, because actually I won't inspire in that regard. I'm just, <laughs> I'm another one that's in that 50 white male uh, category. Uh, but it is a problem for us. People are retiring. And I think the average age of a train driver is around about 52 mm. now. Uh, so we've got to get younger recruits on. And we are working on something right now in the department to actually allow the age to be even more attractive in terms of getting the young on board. So we are looking to take steps uh, to make rail attractive. But again, that's where I say it's not government's job, it's the industry. You know, that's why we need to reform the industry. We need rail reform. We need the private sector because you're the ones that know how to recruit and retain the best talent. Next question, please. Uh, Norman Baker, former rail minister. Ah. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I want to talk about modal shift very briefly because we've talked about modal shift on freight, but modal shift on passengers is also very important. But the d disconnect is there not over many decades, 20, 30 years at least, between what tra transport ministers want to do and what treasury ministers want to do. And we've seen over the last 20, 30 years, rail prices going up way above inflation, bus fares above inflation, and yet we've had, for example, 12 or 13 years of fuel duty being frozen, and we've seen even an APD cut for aviation. So the treasury appears to be doing everything it can to, un to be unhelpful towards how, uh, tackling climate change. So the question really is, what are you, do what are you two gentlemen doing engaging with your treasury teams to make sure that all your good words, which are, are genuine on both sides, are actually not stymied by your treasury colleagues. Hugh, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, the the two special advisors are looking very nervous. As I <laughs> Norman, you're a terrible man, but a great one uh, as well. So, uh, look, we work across partnership with government. It's absolutely right, and Stephen talked about fiscal rules. We have our uh, our, our targets with regards to inflation and not increasing the debt and being able to reduce taxes. So it's that balance. Um, and of course, you know, we have seen uh, fuel prices spike upwards, so the motorists have had a challenge uh, as well. We all, I'm sure some of us use the car as well as, as well as the train. And I will come back to this. If you take the two um, increases, but actually where they should have been, which would have been much greater if we'd used the usual uh, inflation peg, taken together, that's actually the, the largest sort of UK taxpayer sort of subsidy, even though it's felt quite a lot for uh, the rail passenger. And we have to find that, that balance. If we actually load it all off, off the taxpayer, uh, then we're going to have to fund it somewhere, and that has to be found from somewhere else. And so it's finding that balance. And I, I do find that we actually get the support of the Treasury. Um, we had the support all the way through the COVID years when, you know, quite frankly, other parts didn't necessarily get that same support. The rail kept on running. And 100 billion since 2010, I would say the Treasury are helping us out. Stephen, on that one, how would you make Rachel Reeves and the Treasury team? Yeah, so obviously Keir set out his five national missions for our country. A key part of that is growing our economy. There isn't a specific one related to transport, but our priorities around transport are interwoven throughout our missions, be that on the Green Pledge, be that on uh, breaking down barriers to opportunity, be it on you know, what we want to do in terms of growing the economy. And obviously underpinning all of that is our very strict fiscal rules that Rachel Reeves will have with an iron fist to make sure that we deliver on our commitments. And I think what we've got to do is make sure we've got a clear industrial strategy for our country, which is currently absent. We've got to make sure that we invest in rail to connect communities and grow our economy. I think we've got time for probably about two more questions. Has anyone else got a question? Um, let's do um, one on the side well, here and one in the middle. Up. And the man in the red tie, you've had your hand up for ages. Thank you. Uh, Julian Worth, Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. Gentlemen, be warned, I'm going to put you on the spot. Governments are spending many hundreds of millions of pounds on decarbonisation of maritime and aviation and road transport, but so far resolutely refused to electrify three miles to Britain's second largest container port at London Gateway. We might have 70% of passenger journeys for electric traction. We have less than 10% of freight. The question to you, and I'll put you on the spot here, Will you commit to spend just £20 million a year for the five years of the next parliament to electrify the freight electrification infills, which will allow us to move many hundreds of millions of train miles a year with electric haulage? Before you answer that one, we'll take another question as well. You can uh, do them both at once. Sorry. Um, me again. Uh, this time, not freight. Um, it's a question for the Shadow Minister. Um, so if a, a Conservative government were re-elected, I think probably everybody in this room is pretty sure that reform will be imminent uh, in 
terms of in terms of the legislature. If the Labour government were to were to come into play, how long would we have to wait for reform to happen? Because you mentioned before uh, a, a report you commissioned to Jürgen Meyer, which is kind of it, it's similar to the the the, 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 the William Schatz kind of review, Are we, do we, will we have to wait another three years till we see reform actually happen? Thank you. And we'll just take the last question and then I'll make sure they answer all of them. There was uh, one in the middle here, yeah. Uh, Mark Bailey, uh, uh, a non-exec on the board of Network Rail, and I chair the property board. Oh. And Network Rail is the largest land owner in the country and Great British Railways will be too, with a large amount of brownfield sites available for development, mixed use development, but being brownfield require investment. And I wonder what your perspective indeed commitments are on that. Thank you. Okay, shall we um, start with Stephen, how long will your reform plans take? Um, we need to get on with it. Uh, I think all the dither and delay we've seen over the years around rail reform suggests that you know we need some certainty and clarity, and that's why priority of an incoming Labour government would be the rail reform agenda that we want to deliver and, and a Railways Act as quickly as we possibly can in government. Do you know which are the first franchises to end that you might bring into um, public ownership? So we will set out all of that in our um, in our Railway Act that we bring, bring forward as, as soon as we. Uh, when will we get a sense of your plans? When. Are they in when the next coming? few weeks. Few weeks, okay. Um, network Rail, um, do you want to talk about the brownfield land and what you might do with it? Yeah, so Devco, which we are looking for Network Rail to, to set up, uh, they need our support and they will get it, um, is uh, currently looking at some pretty extraordinary and exciting plans in terms of utilising uh, the land around the railway uh, to, to develop. So there is an uh, intergovernmental task force that's set up under the housing minister where we are put under the cosh for how many houses we mm -hmm. can actually release and Network Rail is doing a brilliant job but we know that you can do even more uh, with our support and I'm committed to giving Robin and Peter uh, that, that support. A word on that from you Stephen? Yeah I mean as I said in my speech we need to uh, stop supporting the blockers and, and support our builders so Jürgen Mayer's uh, independent review expert led review on infrastructure will conclude soon and obviously that will set out reforms to the planning system, how we achieve value for money, uh, boost the British supply chain and actually unlock the potential for our country. And on the question about electrification? Yes, again, Norman made the sort of point about you know, we can't just spend money as a spending department, we actually need to seek uh, permission from the Treasury. But there are the sort of like last miles to ports uh, exercise that we're actually looking at that would benefit freight. So I can't give you... The, I can see why you were such a popular draw around you, because it was such a direct question. <laughs> Sorry, I can't, but uh, it is something that we're actually looking at. One of the things I would say, my experience of... I uh, spent a long time scrutinising government, and you're right, I have mm -hmm. been quite critical, and then all of a sudden you find 18 months where you've actually got the experience. And I say this to Stephen, is that once you've actually got something across government, I mean across officials, where you've actually got sign-off for it, it's best to actually focus around that, because you can then land it. If you start the process all, all, all over again, and you're right to make some of the points about the the years in the, the William Shapps review, because it kept changing, then you have to start the machine of government all over again, and government doesn't quite work as fast as the private sector does. So uh, another good plug for supporting this particular reform. <laughs> and I think that's all the questions we've got time for. Thank you so much to Hugh and Stephen for giving us your time and taking so many questions on so many different issues, uh, some of them big, some of them very niche. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, my reflection on this is that there is quite a lot of agreement between the two of you, actually. You both agree on reform. Uh, you both agree that there is a lot of technology that's not being harnessed. And you both agree that the experience for passengers could be a lot better. But um, still, there are some big differences. And we, I think we heard from you that there's a chance that the legislation comes before the election, but not a big one. We expect the, the scrutiny to, to be finished this summer. <laughs> And Stephen, we look forward to hearing a bit more about Labour's plans for public ownership, because it sounds like there's quite a few other models which you also think uh, might work. 
I know Andy said that rail is not going to be a top order issue in the election, but I think these questions tonight show that it's at the heart of lots of things which are top order issues, whether it's the economy, cost of living, tackling climate change, social mobility, housing, you name it. So I think transport could be a very interesting uh, part of what we know will be a very busy election campaign later this year. And it's been great to hear all of your views on it. Um, I'll now hand over to Andy to uh, give some closing remarks. Thanks very much, Tamara. Um, I just want to close the event with a few quick thoughts and thank yous. Um, first and most importantly, thank you uh, to our speakers, Hugh Merriman and Stephen Morgan, for participating this evening. As Tamara, you've just said, I said in my opening remarks that while perhaps rail doesn't matter to the election, the election really matters for rail. And I think that's been really borne out this evening with what we've heard uh, from both speakers, also from the audience. There are some big challenges we're facing uh, and some significant differences between the parties as to how to solve them. Um, I think it's worth saying that whoever ends up in Great Minster House following the election uh, has a responsibility to set the railway up for success. Not for its own sake, uh, but for the wider economic and environmental benefits that it delivers for the country. And I'd say to Hugh and Stephen, people in this room believe in the railway. Uh, and the industry will work with whoever is in government to implement solutions in the best interests uh, of our customers, passengers and freight customers. And I'd urge you to just be cognizant of the skills and the experience uh, in all parts of the railway that's in this room tonight. And you need that to set the industry uh, on a track to growth. Um, Hugh, thank you uh, specifically for the extensive plug for our manifesto, uh, and I'd encourage the audience, uh, please do take them home with you, uh, if only to save the team from picking them up from the floor. Um, Stephen, uh, while we do have some fundamental disagreements with what Labour's proposing, we're very grateful for your attendance tonight, and we hope that the conversation will uh, continue through the pre-legislative scrutiny of the draft bill and then on uh, to the election. Uh, you said that you would follow the evidence and that what matters uh, is what works. We think that the evidence uh, clearly shows it doesn't have to be a binary choice between a monopoly railway in public hands and one that delivers competition and innovation by harnessing uh, the uh, private sector operator. Uh, we think what works is having the best of both public and private sectors. And that's what's happening across uh, Europe, increasing use of private operators within a coherent public framework. And as I said in my introduction, we would like the opportunity to formally put our case to you uh, before Labour finalises and publishes uh, your plans. Now, as you all know, uh, events like this don't just happen. Uh, so I also want to thank uh, Tamara Cohen uh, for chairing uh, superbly this evening. Thank you very much, Tamara. <laughs> I'd also like to thank uh, Rachel and uh, Rob and the rest of the team at Total Politics for their support with uh, logistics for putting on tonight. If you could give them a round of applause. <laughs> I'd also like to thank the team uh, at Rail Partners and especially uh, Hannah Moxon, uh, who was responsible for tonight, um, but for the whole team for all their efforts uh, in making the evening happen. Thank you. <laughs> And then last one, thank you to all of you. Thanks to everyone in the audience uh, for coming and also those who've uh, joined to watch online. Uh, hopefully we'll see you again next year, tomorrow. That there are drinks.